live now. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County. We're joined today by London Mayor Ed Holder and the Medical Officer of Health and CEO of the Middlesex London Health Unit, Dr. Chris Mackey. We'd like to welcome the media who are in attendance and invite them to submit their questions using the question forum here on Microsoft Teams. Just a reminder for those asking questions to please indicate your name and media outlet. We'd also like to welcome those viewers tuning in on Rogers Television, Rogers Facebook page and YouTube channel, as well as those listening on Global News Radio and those watching on the CTV London website. We'll get to the opening statements right away and we'll start with London Mayor Ed Holder. Mayor Holder. Well, thank you, Beth, and good afternoon, everyone. A couple of uh, quick updates from me. Uh, first, from our uh, bylaw folks, uh, I, I thought you should uh, know, as we do every Monday, give you some sense of the of the uh, status of bylaw enforcement. We actually issued 16 uh, verbal uh, warnings over the weekend, uh, all issued throughout parks in the city. Now, none of these uh, warnings resulted in challenges in charges, but we continue to have to reapply caution tape to the play structures as it appears the tape is being removed. Do you remember that time when some irresponsible individual took a lot of tape off one of the infrastructure uh, playground pieces of equipment? It's like this, but we're saying please stop. That kind of activity is extremely frustrating. The tape's there for a reason, as is the directive to avoid using playground equipment until further notice. The, Here's the great news. The vast majority of Londoners have been terrific when it comes to following those rules and direction, taking the appropriate precautions and staying patient with respect to those restrictions that remain in place. That said, when we're dealing with a pandemic, the vast majority simply isn't good enough. We need everybody on board and we need everybody following health and safety guidelines. We've seen in other jurisdictions and in other countries what happens when a handful of people decide the rules don't apply to them. Such behavior has the potential to not only undo all the good work we've seen over the last three plus months, it also has the potential to put lives at risk. So one other quick point. We saw another such example over the weekend uh, with a large group of young people getting together for a backyard barbecue. Look, I'm sure Dr. Mackey will talk in more detail about that incident, but again, this kind of thing is absolutely unacceptable. We've been dealing with this since early March, and now it's almost July. Look, everyone knows the rules, everyone knows what's at stake, and everyone should know better. When we have put people, when we have people deliberately flouting public health and safety recommendation, it puts everyone and everything at risk. Think of business owners, think of employees, think of your own families who work, many of whom have only recently started going back to work and now finally earning an income after months of uncertainty. Is it worth the risk of running, worth the risk of impacting their lives and risking another shutdown if we, if we start experiencing multiple outbreaks? Think of those as residents at long-term care and retirement homes. The people who provide them with care are coming in and out of those facilities on a regular basis. Be it a backyard gathering or a house party, is it worth the potentially catastrophic impact of a COVID outbreak in any of those facilities? Of course not. By and large, we're doing a great job in London. We've talked about by and large. So let's continue to hold ourselves and others accountable to ensure we don't undo all the progress we've made over the last several months. It's just too important to accept anything less. So these are a couple of uh, areas that uh, frankly are uh, are me and my position hitting the concern button. Uh, but uh, to get to the, the numbers and to the things that are of substance, let's go to Dr. Mackey. Much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so beginning with the numbers, uh, we had uh, a significant increase in cases locally over the weekend. Uh, for the last week or so, we have three or less cases per day, including some days with zero uh, or one cases. Uh, over the weekend, we had six cases on Saturday, uh, three yesterday, one on Friday, so 10 over a three day period. Uh, not a tremendous increase over average over that three day period, but what is concerning is the outbreak that you heard the mayor refer to earlier. Uh, that is uh, a total of eight cases uh, among a group of uh, north of 25 people who had been gathering 
in various places in various ways. Uh, certainly, has at least one large barbecue gathering among this group of young adults, um, but uh, still investigating all of the different contacts and different settings uh, where this group has been interacting. Provincially, uh, the numbers have been mixed over the last few days. Uh, today, 257 cases, which is a significant increase of what we've seen in the last week or so. Again, we don't want to make too much out of one day's worth of numbers, uh, but that is a, a significant number. Uh, the other th thing that is significant as part of that is that uh, there really has been a significant increase in cases reported in the Windsor-Essex area in the uh, migrant farm worker and other uh, farm settings. Uh, this is really part of what's driving ongoing high provincial numbers. Uh, and so it was over the weekend that the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario reached out to the Middlesex London Health Unit and asked us to provide support to Windsor Essex Health Unit, uh, which we have now done. Uh, Dr. Alex Summers, our Associate Medical Officer of Health, who has also been our incident commander uh, for our internal response to coronavirus, uh, has been um, uh, seconded temporarily uh, to Windsor Essex County Health Unit. The, with Alex, we've sent two of our uh, most experienced uh, frontline case management staff, and hopefully together they're able to offer Windsor some support in this difficult time. The issue, of course, um, of challenges working with farm workers does not stop at the border of Windsor and Essex, and that's something we will be uh, doing in, in much uh, greater numbers than we have in the past in terms of both working with uh, farmers to make sure that workers are able to get access to testing for coronavirus. Uh, we're planning to go on site later this week to test on uh, some of our larger farms that use temporary foreign workers in this region. Uh, we're also planning to work with farms uh, to strengthen measures to ensure that appropriate public health uh, precautions are taken uh, in those farm environments. Uh, and that's uh, in partnership with the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario again. So I will pause there. I would imagine there are questions today. Yes, we do have lots of questions in the queue here today. So thank you, Mayor Holder, Dr. Mackey, for those opening statements. We'll get to the questions right away. The first one here is for you, Dr. Mackey. It's a three-part question from Carrie McKee at CBC Live. To today's news release about people attending larger gatherings. So the three questions. Were these gatherings at a bar or private party? Where did they go outside of Middlesex, London? What other municipalities? And are any of them sick? Okay, so thank you, Carrie, for the questions. Uh, first of all, there were, the gatherings were at private parties. Uh, we don't yet have any, uh, any indication that these uh, parties or gatherings were in public places. Uh, so that's somewhat reassuring. Uh, second, where did they go outside of Middlesex and London? Uh, we're aware of travel to the Waterloo region and to the Hamilton area. Uh, there may have been travel beyond that in the extended group. We're still uh, investigating that. And then are any of them sick? Uh, some of the cases have had symptoms. Uh, some of them uh, have been uh, tested only as a matter of precaution, but at this point, uh, none of them have uh, severe illness. Uh, this is in keeping with the trend of young people. Uh, although young people can acquire the virus, uh, the risk of severe outcome tends to be lower in, uh, in younger folks. Thanks, Dr. Mackey. The next question here comes from Dan Brown at the London Free Press. Dr. Mackey, Dan Brown would like to know, the warning the health unit sent out today about large gatherings comes as people are getting ready to celebrate Canada Day on Wednesday. What does this mean for any Canada Day parties that were in the works? Is Canada Day cancelled? What we have here is a situation where we all want this pandemic to be over. But the reality is the virus is still in our community. It is lurking and if people are not cautious about their Canada Day parties, they will end up being COVID parties. Please take precautions. 
please continue to limit the number of people gathering to 10 or less. Thanks, Dr. Mackey. And just a follow up here from Dan Brown at the London Free Press. Dr. Mackey, Dan Brown would like to know the cases in the warning today affected eight people all in their 20s. Do you have any message for young people who will be celebrating Canada Day on Wednesday? Important for young people to know that they're not immune to the coronavirus. They can acquire it, they can have bad outcomes, and they can spread it to other people who are more vulnerable. Uh, we are seeing uh, some indications of a trend of young people taking less precautions. Uh, and we hope that this sort of outbreak in a group of people in their 20s uh, who are otherwise quite healthy is a wake up call to that generation. Thanks, Dr. Mackey, for that uh, follow up response. We have another question here from Dan Brown with the London Free Press. Dr. Mackey, your counterpart, Dr. Summers, has gone to Essex to help its health unit battle COVID-19 there. What effect will his absence have on the health unit's work here in Middlesex, London? And the second part to the question, have you and Dr. Summers been maintaining your agreement not to be in the same room together for the duration of the pandemic for succession purposes in case one of you gets sick? Uh, yes, absolutely. Dr. Summers and I, uh, we have made eye contact from a distance, but uh, we've definitely kept our distance uh, and, and avoided being in the same room for the duration of this pandemic thus far. Uh, what does Dr. Summers' redeployment to Essex, uh, Windsor-Essex, mean for our health unit? Well, it means that I step into uh, filling the role that he filled in addition to the work that I've been doing as well. Uh, the, uh, you know, I had shared my first IMS meeting in some time this morning, uh, and it went great. The, the reality is we have deep bench strength here. Uh, a lot of confidence in the senior leadership team and uh, the managers and the staff that are doing the work here. Uh, very professional, very experienced, uh, very uh, careful and wise in the judgment. And uh, we're very lucky to uh, have such a great staff team here. Great. Thanks very much, Dr. Mackey, for that. Um, we do have a question here for Mayor Holder. Um, I'm not sure who, who it's from, uh, Mayor Holder. Um, we're just waiting to find that out, but I, I will go forward with it. Mayor Holder, with the week of warm weather ahead, do you have any updates on public pool openings? At this point, uh, we are opening and have opened our waiting pools. Uh, what we are doing is anticipating that in early July, within certainly the first uh, couple of weeks, we anticipate having all the protocols in place to ensure that that all of the public pools will be open and available at that time. And I'll just ask media, please, to uh, stay tuned to uh, these uh, press conferences so that we can ensure that people are updated. But I will also tell you we will send out an appropriate press release once those are open. Thanks very much. I think that lots of people are looking towards as the weather gets warmer into July. The next question we have here, Dr. Mackey, is for you. It's from Grant Demi at MyFM Strathroy. Dr. Mackey, with people having parties and the recent large showing of residents at the Grand Bend Beach, do you feel that the region and Ontario as a whole are in store for a wake-up call? Well, uh... I think that if we don't take precautions, we will see this virus come roaring back. Uh, this is a virus that spreads easily, especially in large gatherings. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, may, maybe I'll also talk about an outbreak that happened in Kingston last week, uh, where you had in a community, Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, Addington, uh, in their health unit, uh, they'd seen zero to one cases since the beginning of May, almost two months of no COVID spread. Uh, that's zero to one cases a week. And uh, overnight, they have now 18 cases and potentially more, uh, all associated with one nail salon. So this is the sort of situation where uh, it looks like probably one case has generated, you know, well over a dozen additional cases. Uh, so it's kind of in the category of what I would describe as a super spreader event. We know that the average case early on would spread to about three additional cases, uh, but 
what that average hides is that most cases spread to no additional cases and a handful of cases spread to a large number of additional cases. Uh, so the super spreader events are something we really want to pay attention to and look closely at. Um, and it's why uh, we're putting this messaging out uh, and linking it directly to the Canada Day celebrations uh, because there's a potential for super spreader events at uh, any celebration where you have a large gathering of people. And uh, the other thing that this is triggering yet again for us is a very careful uh, reassessment of all of the information around uh, the effectiveness of masking, the appropriateness of uh, ordering mandatory masking and other potential interventions such as distributing free masking. Those are all uh, back on the table for us. We'll be looking carefully at the research evidence over the next few days uh, and uh, looking to uh, probably announce on Thursday what we determine the best course of action there. And the, the thing you know that has certainly changed is the assessment that our case counts are very low and so the risk in the community is very low. We now know that uh, in spite of the best efforts, I think the healthcare, healthcare system overall is doing a tremendous job of making sure that we get lots of people tested there are blind spots in that testing. Uh, temporary foreign workers who don't normally access healthcare in Canada are one of those blind spots. Another blind spot is young people. Uh, we're seeing young people now uh, getting tested, whereas they haven't in the past. Uh, and so we're seeing more uh, cases in young, young folks. Uh, so we're uh, looking forward to discussing that issue more on Thursday. Thanks, Dr. Mackey, for that response. The next question we have here is for you, Dr. Mackey. It's a three-part question from Sawyer Bogdan at 980 CFPL Global News. So the three parts to this question, Dr. Mackey, the outbreak related to the gatherings. Do we know how many gatherings? Were the first gatherings in London or elsewhere? Do we know how many potential people may have come in contact? So, um what we have is a group of people who have been very cooperative uh, and sharing lots of information, what they have available. Uh, there are limits to the information. This is not a uh, group of partiers that you know diligently records exactly who was at each party that they attended. And so uh, we're still working out some of those details. And uh, we, we certainly Certainly, uh, we'll do our best to share with the public uh, when there's information related to this outbreak that has public health implications. At this point, the most important takeaway from this outbreak is that when you're gathering large groups, uh, particularly potentially in a partying atmosphere uh, that may have close contact associated, uh, you're putting yourselves and your in your your party goers at risk. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. And a question here now from Dan Brown with the London Free Press. This group of more than 25 people gathering, were they gathering in the city itself, in the county, or any specific neighborhood? I appreciate the question, uh, Dan. I understand why you, why you want that uh, answer. The reality is we know that coronavirus has affected every neighborhood uh, across the city and the county. Uh, these folks happen to be gathering in London, but that doesn't mean that if you're gathering in, you know, in uh, Strathroy or in Dorchester or in Kamoka, that there's any less risk uh, that you would see a super spreader event in your community. We continue to have cases in both city and the county and uh, large gatherings are always a risk. Thank you very much, Dr. Mackey. We have another question here from Sawyer Bogdan, 980 CFPL Global News Radio for you. Dr. Mackey, as things start to reopen, there are a lot of people lining up to get onto patios and getting back outside again. Is there a worry about an increase in cases? What's your recommendation heading into Canada Day to stay safe? Well, I absolutely understand uh, why people would want to line up for a patio uh, and say, I can't say I've made it out yet, uh, but hope to sometime over the next week or two. The you know most uh, most facilities are careful about making sure that their patrons are distancing one in line, uh, and certainly that's what I would encourage both the the uh, 
the patios, the restaurant uh, operators, and also the, the patrons to do is make sure you're still keeping your uh, six foot distance or two meters apart while you're standing in line. Beth, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thanks, Dr. Mackey. We do have another question here from Sawyer Bogdan, 980 CFPL Global News Radio. Dr. Mackey, can you explain what supporting role the MLHU will play in helping Windsor Essex County Health Unit respond to outbreaks in the agri farm sector? Sure, Ken. We'll be playing two uh, primary roles. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Alex Summers will assist with assessment uh, medically about the uh, validity of tests and the appropriateness of uh, people that are testing positive, uh, isolating, or continuing to work or other. Uh, the, there, there is a significant amount of medical work to be done uh, and uh, that work can be quite challenging given the language barriers and that there are often literacy rate, there are often literacy issues uh, with folks that are in the temporary foreign worker program. Uh, and so uh, doing the best to support the medical officer of health in uh, Windsor, Essex to do those medical assessments. Uh, the other important point is around case and contact uh, management. Following up with, you know, uh, over 180 cases obviously takes a lot of time and resources. And so there's a lot of work to be done uh, contacting each of those cases, uh, not to mention their contacts. And th to give you a sense of the scale, you know, 182 cases, uh, I haven't heard of an outbreak that's bigger than that in uh, in uh, any farm setting in Canada. Uh, this, this is something that, you know, 182 is more than the vast majority of Ontario health units have had in this entire pandemic. Uh, so that's that's a huge burden on a health unit that is uh, one of uh, Ontario's mid-sized health units. Thank you very much, Dr. Mackey, for that response. We do have one final question here from Dan Brown at the London Free Press. And just a point of clarification, Dr. Mackey, can you reiterate again the definition of a super spreader event? Yeah, so the, the what I consider a super spreader event in our context is where you get uh, one case that is associated with a dozen secondary cases. Uh, it's not a hard and fast uh, definition. What we, but when, when you're far exceeding the uh, early average of three cases per uh, index case, uh, and even lately the average has been more like one or less than one case. Uh, per each index case. Uh, that's when you start to talk about su the super spreader phenomenon. And, uh, you know, th there are uh, a few examples of how we've seen super spreader events in this coronavirus pandemic. First of all, they certainly have been less common uh, than in the past in the healthcare system. Uh, for example, SARS, the majority of the super spreader events were in healthcare where we didn't have appropriate particles, protocols. Uh, you know, nine years ago during the SARS epidemic uh, to make sure that high risk medical procedures were done in, clo in close environments and staff were appropriately protected. That risk has been essentially uh, eliminated by better protocols in healthcare. The super spread events we continue to have are places like, uh, well, so uh, some well documented examples are in a uh, restaurant where the individual who was positive was sitting just beside an air conditioner unit, which blew the virus through the whole restaurant. And you had several people came, became infected after that. Um, there's another example in a choir where uh, one person who was positive uh, going into a uh, choir rehearsal generated uh, infect infections uh, in uh, many additional people uh, from that choir. Again, the, there's a there's a not just a case, but a, a reason why that individual uh, situation creates that spread. Singing, we know, releases a lot more uh, viral particles and droplets than just simple talking. Uh, there's another super spreader event in a um, 
in a call center where um, there were, you know, workers were not spaced at all. Uh, you, this was in, uh, I believe it was Thailand, uh, but you had very densely packed uh, workers uh, working with nothing, essentially nothing between uh, their workspaces. And so one individual on, uh, you know, on, a, on a floor of a building uh, infected several other people on that floor. Uh, incidentally, that outbreak was helpful because uh, although there was a super spreader event on the floor, nobody in the, in the other floors of the building became sick and associated with that one index case in the uh, call center. And so it's one of the things that helps us to uh, realize that the risk is primarily with that close face-to-face -face contact and less so with things like, you know, push bars on doors, handles, elevator push, elevator buttons. Those are still potentially a factor, uh, but uh, evidence is growing that they're much more, much less so than that face-to-face -face contact. Dr. Mackey for that response. We do have another question that did come in here. Um, this one comes from Casey Taylor with Rogers Media. This question is for you, Dr. Mackey. Casey would like to know, if I understand you that you're now re-examining whether or not to order mandatory masking with a decision to come Thursday. Given these newest party cases were private and not public, what specifically has changed between now and late last week when you said the evidence wasn't strong enough for mandating masks and community spread was low enough not to require it? Yeah, that's exactly those are the questions that we're looking at right now. Uh, the, the, it was the outbreak in Kingston that was uh, really a red flag from my perspective. Uh, this is a community that's had a rate of disease even lower than here in Middlesex, London uh, for, you know, at that time over six weeks. Uh, so like zero to one cases per week, you know, the population is smaller, uh, but it's a comparable city in many ways in terms of uh, their relationship with GTA, uh, in terms of the demographics of the population, and to see them go from zero, 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 16, and then even more over the weekend, uh, that's pretty concerning. And it changes how, uh, how we interpret the low numbers that we've had recently. Uh, the, the local party cases, party associated cases, uh, are less of a factor on um, reconsidering the mask situation, but certainly they are a factor as well to show that, again, there's enough virus here to uh, generate uh, an outbreak, uh, even when um, so many of us are doing so much to continue uh, to get, take precautions. Thanks very much, Dr. Mackey, for that response. Um, that uh, leaves us with no more questions in the queue for this afternoon, so that will conclude the briefing for this afternoon. We'd like to thank you, Dr. Mackey and Mayor Holder, for joining us this afternoon, and we would like to um, thank all the viewers up there as well. Um, we'll see you again tomorrow at 2 p.m. when we will be joined by Middlesex County Warden Kathy Burghardt-Jessen. Thanks very much and have a great afternoon.